Okay, so today uh, we'll be looking at um, our second early modern uh, theorist, uh, our second person who's really important for the development of the dominant theories in uh, international relations. Uh, so we'll be looking at the enormously influential uh, philosopher Immanuel Kant. Um, and I think it's really kind of difficult to overstate Kant's uh, importance. Um, he's really an absolute giant of, of philosophy, of political theory, of cultural theory, of international uh, relations theory, um, and really any other um, intellectual endeavor you can think of. Like, he's, he's played a big role. So he's just, uh, he's, he's really massively important. Uh, and actually, um, a, uh, the work of a pretty significant portion of the theorists that you're going to be reading in this course, um, and really in a lot of courses that you take at university, are going to be one way or the other influenced by his work. Um, really, even those who end up disagreeing with what he has to say um, still have to engage with it. So uh, he's, really, he's really quite a big deal. Oh, if he goes forward, that's good. Okay, this works. Uh, uh, so today, um, first we'll be looking at uh, Kant's life, um, and then kind of in line with the Kimberly Hutchings uh, primary reading that I've given you, we'll be looking at his theory of knowledge, his moral philosophy, and then finally his international uh, political philosophy. Um, now all of these, um, yeah, they're going to they're gonna come back again and again, I think, in this course. Um, so even if they don't seem to explicitly relate to international relations, uh, they're going to be important. Uh, really, for, for someone who is so amazingly influential, um, uh, he kind of lived quite a straightforward life. Um, he was born in 1724 in uh, Konigsberg in Prussia, um, which is now uh, Kaliningrad in, in Russia. Um, but at that time, it was German-speaking. Uh, and of course, Kant's work is all in, in German. He enrolled in the University of Konigsberg in 19, uh, not 1970, in, in uh, 1770. No, that can't be right. He enrolled in the university, let's just say. Um, but he uh, uh, was originally enrolled as a theology student, but very quickly he became attracted to mathematics um, and to philosophy. Uh, in, 14, in 1746, though, his father died, and he had to leave the university in order to help his family. Uh, and so he worked as a private tutor for a decade um, in order to provide for this quite large family. Um, he was the fourth of, of nine children. Uh, but he was finally able to return to the university in 1755 and receive his doctorate that same year. Um, and then he worked uh, at the university as a lecturer and a tutor for the next 15 years. And eventually, in 1770, he became a full professor teaching metaphysics and logic. Um, over this period, he wrote a number of really important books um, on politics, on ethics, on metaphysics, on epistemology, on aesthetics, on the philosophy of religion, um, and the philosophy of science. So again, you know, wide ranging and a very big deal. Before we discuss Kant's thought on international relations, though, um, I want to look at another dimension of his work that may at first seem somewhat tangential to international uh, politics, which is his philosophy of knowledge. Um, but in a, in a class that focuses on a critical international relations theory, uh, I think his philosophy, his theory of knowledge, couldn't actually be any more important. Uh, because really, it's this, uh, these ideas that form the basis of critical theory. Critical theory would not exist without this theory of knowledge. And so, of course, we wouldn't have critical uh, IR theory. And the reason for this is that critical theory relies on there being such a thing as conditions of possibility of knowledge. Right? So their idea is that we cannot just know things. Uh, we, we can't know things directly. We can't uh, take things from the world directly. We always have a certain framework uh, by which we can make sense of the things that we observe. Um, and this kind of isn't entirely obvious. It's not, I think, the common sense of view of, of most people most of the time. Um, empiricists, for example, they claim that all we need to know, all we need to have to know about anything in the world are our observations, um, our sense data, right? Um, and positivist science more or less makes the same kind of assumption. We just have this data going in, and then we know something about the world. 
um, and then we write it down, of course, and then we, you know, we can make a theory and, and so on. But Kant says, no, you know, not so fast. It doesn't work in quite such a simple way. He argues that we have what he calls categories of understanding. Um, so he thinks that the mind doesn't just passively receive the information uh, of our senses. Uh, it actually actively uh, shapes and makes sense of that information. Um, so, you know, for example, we perceive events taking place in time, right? Uh, but the reason we perceive events taking place in time, according to Kant, is because of our pre-existing faculties of the mind, right? Our mind is what arranges the sensory experience um, in a temporal progression over time, right? We don't directly perceive, um, as the empiricists, uh, empiricists think we do, things happening in time. So for the empiricists, we just observe things happening in time, goes in, and then we know something. We can't know. We observe things, but then our mind imposes this idea of time onto the things that we observe. So we have this built-in intuition of time. And by combining our sense experience with that intuition, um, then we uh, come to view things as occurring in a temporal progression. Uh, he thinks the same is true of cause and effect, right? He thinks our mind has this basic intuition of causation. Um, so we perceive events occurring, um, and our mind combines our intuition of causation and the things that we're observing um, such that we perceive uh, some events causing other events, right? But he thinks it's not something we're just observing in the world. We're not directly observing an event causing another event. Right? It's something that our mind, because of the basic categories, the basic intuitions that the mind has, um, it imposes this on the raw sense data that we're observing. Um, so as the, um, uh, the Scottish philosopher David Hume said, and he was actually a big influence on, on Kant as well, um, he points out that we can never perceive causation directly. Right? We can only perceive a thing occurring and then another thing occurring, and then uh, our mind puts those two things together into a causal relationship. Uh, Kant thinks we also have an intuition of space. Uh, so without this faculty of our understanding, without this intuition, we wouldn't be able to situate objects as occurring in space. Objects wouldn't appear to be near or far or here or there or, or anything like that, in front of us, behind us, and so on. Um, it's only because we have a certain basic uh, faculty of the understanding that imposes that uh, idea onto the, onto the things that we, uh, onto the sense data that we take in. So we don't get our knowledge from um, our reason alone um, because we need the sense data, um, but we can't get knowledge directly from the empirical world either. Uh, our faculties of understanding are completely tied up, they're completely necessary um, for us to be able to make sense of the empirical world, to make sense of the things that we're seeing and hearing and smelling and so on. Right? Without, these <clears throat> without these faculties, without these um, baked in intuitions about causation, about time, about space, uh, we just have no ability to make sense of any of the sense data that we're taking in. Um, but of course, you know, without the sense data, we wouldn't have anything to make sense of, so we need that as well. Uh, now, a metaphor um, for this is the idea of a person wearing uh, tinted glasses, right? So someone who wears blue tinted glasses, for example, um, they see everything in a, in a bluish light, right? Um, for Kant, our mind wears time tinted, causation tinted, and space tinted sunglasses. Right? And there's nothing we can do about that. It's just something that's built into the way our minds operate. So everything that we perceive, everything we hear, we smell, we see, and so on, um, is filtered through these particular lenses. Um, so we cannot help but see things as occurring in time and as occurring in space and as being part of a causal chain. <clears throat> So this is what we mean by the conditions uh, of possibility of knowledge. Our minds, um, as structured in certain uh, ways, um, 
force us to understand things within certain bounds. They limit and constrain and direct how we understand the world around us. Um, the lenses that we have in our mind are the conditions of the possibility of understanding anything in the empirical, uh, in, in the empirical world. So everything that we take in is filtered through this. But of course, Kant's thought here um, was revolutionary for the time, doesn't quite get us to critical theory though. Um, because for Kant, these faculties of our understanding, um, the lenses, the conditions uh, of the possibility of our knowledge, uh, they are trans-historical, right? They're just built into us as human beings. They're something everyone automatically has all the time, doesn't matter you know, this, what society they're in, doesn't matter where they are, that's just the way the mind works, according to Kant. So critical theory takes Kant's ideas as a starting point, but then it says, all right, so if our ability to make sense of the world, right, and even our ability to make sense of really basic sense data, um, is only made possible by and is structured by um, these faculties of the understanding, what would it mean if there were faculties of the understanding that aren't trans-historical but are actually historically situated? Right? So in other words, what if the time that we live in, that the society, uh, the ideas, the beliefs, the ideologies of our society act to delimit the conditions of the possibility of understanding just as much as Kant's basic uh, faculties of the understanding do. So what if all of these things, what if our upbringing, um, the beliefs of, of our society and so on, what if they act as filters just as much? So I think thinking about things in this way, um, we can see that if knowledge is only possible by being filtered through our minds, right, and if the way that we filter things is historically situated, uh, then all knowledge that we have about the world is also historically situated, right? Uh, so that means there's no such thing as objective knowledge. Now this is not saying, to be clear, that there's no such thing as objective reality. No one's, no one's saying that. Um, but we don't have direct access to this reality, right? We only have access to this reality through uh, our senses, and our senses can only access it or process it through our, uh, our filters, the filters in our mind. So everything we know then, right down to the most basic level, is conditioned by our social reality, by the historical context within which we exist. So I'm sure you can see uh, with this, that Kant's philosophy of knowledge is kind of essential to uh, the kind of critical theorists that we're going to be discussing throughout the course. Now, the second uh, contribution Kant makes to international relations theory, kind of broadly construed, uh, is based in his moral philosophy. So Kant's moral philosophy is based in the idea of pure practical reason. Uh, so we can contrast uh, pure practical reason with the idea of pure reason on the one hand, and practical reason on the other hand. Right? Pure reason is our ability to know things without being shown those things. Um, but of course, pure reason can't tell us anything about, about the world around us. Practical reason, on the other hand, uh, that tells us how to interact with the world of experience. Um, but pure practical reason, it combines both of these things. Right? And we can understand the way it does this by contrasting uh, the, what Kant calls uh, hypothetical imperatives and categorical uh, imperatives, which I'm sure some of you have encountered so far. Has anyone had this come up in class yet? No, great. I can be the first to tell you about it, and that's great. Um, so a hypothetical imperative is something that tells us how to achieve something in the world. Right? So if I say, um, you know, if you want to pass this course, uh, then uh, you need to do the readings and attend the lectures. Right? That's a hy hypothetical and imperative. If you want some, uh, if you want some chips, um, then your practical reason that's going to tell you how to get those chips. Um, if you want to get home from university, your practical reason will say, all right, you know, first get on the bus and then do this and then do that and so on. But the important thing to note is all of the examples I gave. Uh, are prefaced by if, right? If you want A, then you should do B, 
What Kant's interested in is how to work out what we should do to begin with, because practical reason cannot help us with this. Um, it, it can take us back a few steps, for sure. Um, you know, if I want to uh, pass the course, I should do this. Why do I want to pass the course? Well, I want to get my degree. Why do you want your degree? Well, I want a nice job. Um, why do you want a nice job? I want to live a comfortable life, and, and so on. So it takes you back, right? But ultimately, there, there comes a point where practical reason, can't, it can't take you any further. It can't give you the, the why. There's nothing that we can look to in the world then that's able to tell us what we should do, right? what we should choose to begin with. On the other hand, uh, pure reason isn't interested in the world at all. Um, it's all about mathematics and things that we can know without having to look at the world. Um, so that can't, that can't help us out either. And this is where Kant's idea of pure practical reason comes in. So pure practical reason tells us what we ought to do, but it tells us what we ought to do without reference to anything in the world. Um, so we can work out what we ought to do, the practical part, through reason alone, the pure part. So pure practical reason. So how do we do this? <clears throat> Well, instead of using hypothetical imperatives, um, which are you know, imperatives that are valid only if we want certain things, right, that are therefore only conditionally uh, important, uh, we need to work out what would, uh, what would be a categorical imperative. Right? It's, a, it's an imperative that isn't a matter of if we have certain goals. Uh, so a categorical, uh, categorical imperative is something that we ought to do regardless of what our our goals in life happen to be. Um, and because of that, it's something that's universal, right? It's something that all rational beings can't think at all times should aim themselves towards doing, regardless of the context, regardless of personality, of anything else. And this leads to the, uh, the first formulation of the categorical imperative, which is act only according to that maxim whereby you can, at the same time, will that it should become a universal law. So no one's heard that one before? Anyone taken a philosophy class? No? OK, well, that's fine. Um, so a maxim, basically, a maxim is a rule for action. Um, so yeah, it's, it's permissible to lie at my job interviews. It's a rule that you can apply to, to your actions. Now, because of this formulation, um, this makes the categorical imperative a negative rule. Right? It doesn't tell you necessarily what you should do, but rather it tells you what you shouldn't do. Um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, after all, yeah, if a maxim is able to be uh, universalized, right? if, if we can say that this maxim um, can at the same time, I can will that this maxim will at the same time become a, a universal law, um, that will tell us that we can do something, but it doesn't tell us that we have to do something. But if a maxim can't be universalized, then we're forbidden from doing it. So this rule will tell us what we're forbidden from doing. It will tell us that we can do certain things, but it won't tell us that we have to do those things. Now one thing I do want to flag here is a common uh, misconception about the idea of, or the first formulation of the categorical imperative. Um, because we have this term, become a, uh, become a universal law. And Kant doesn't mean law in the sense of a rule that's good for society. Um, so, you know, you could say, okay, what would be good? It would be good if no one smoked tobacco, for example. Um, so that would be great. Um, and let's imagine it's true. I don't, I, I'm not going to make a judgment about whether it's true or not, but hypothetically. Um, we can then say, well, it's good to have this rule. It's good to have a rule that stops people smoking tobacco. Uh, therefore, we should make that a universal law. Um, but that's not the way it works. We can't say, according to this categorical imperative, that because it's good to have this rule, we should therefore make it a universal law. And the reason for this is that uh, uh, things about consequences the idea of consequences, they're a matter for practical reason rather than pure practical reason. Right? It's about if you want this, then you do that. If you get that, then you get this consequence. Um, so any universal law that you come up with, 
that's about good, that's about you know, this is the kind of consequence that we want, means it's actually a hypothetical rather than a categorical imperative because it's about things in the world. If you want this, then get that. If you want this good thing, then you should do this other thing. So Kant doesn't actually think that what's good um, is what morality really should be about to begin with. He thinks that morality is about what's right. So he prioritizes the right over the good. And we can work out what, what is right uh, by working out which maxims, according to pure practical reason, are able to be universalized. So how do we do this? Right? How do we uh, universalize a maxim? Any, any ideas? So we, we need to find contradictions in the maxim. That's how we do it. Um, so let's imagine if I were to say it's permissible to steal. So that's our maxim. It's OK to steal. What would that mean in practice? If I made that a universal law, what would that mean in practice? use your imagination. If it was okay for everyone to steal all the time, what would that mean? What kind of world would that be? Yep. What's that, sorry? You would never have to pay for anything? Yep. Yep, absolutely. So you'd take anything you wanted any time, right? And, you know, that, that, may, be a, that may be a bad world, um, but that's not, that's not Kant's issue. Um, because he doesn't care, he doesn't care about good, he doesn't care about bad, right? Um, what he cares about is that a world in which everyone could steal all the time, in which it was okay to steal all the time, is a world without private property, right? If it's always okay to take other people's stuff, then it doesn't make sense to say that's your stuff to begin with. It doesn't make sense to say this is my stuff, that's your stuff. Because all the stuff belongs to everyone, you know, because you can take it and you're morally allowed to take it all the time. That's the universal law. Because if you say, look, this is my stuff, that implies that other people are morally not allowed to take that stuff, right? That's, that's the way private property works. So a world in which uh, there is no, uh, a world in which this was a maxim uh, is a world without private property. In a world without pri private, for, uh, private property, what would that mean for the idea of stealing? Could you steal stuff in a world without private property? You couldn't. You couldn't steal stuff. What's that? Exactly. It's impossible to steal in a world without private property because everything belongs to you anyway. So you only, it's only possible to steal something if that person has a right to it and you're contravening that right. If no one has a right to anything, stealing doesn't make sense. Right? It's not stealing. So if we say our maxim is it's permissible to steal, but this doesn't make sense as a maxim. It leads to a world in which you can't do that action. You cannot steal. It's saying it's permissible to do something that, if it were universalized, would be literally impossible to do. So this is what Kant thinks is an internally contradictory maxim. Maxim doesn't work because if you actually made it a universal law, it wouldn't make sense. You couldn't, you couldn't perform that action. But this, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, so this takes us to the second formulation of the uh, categorical imperative. Um, now both categorical imperatives, right? The, uh, sorry, both imperatives, the, the categorical and the hypothetical imperatives rest on an idea of free and rational choice. Right? It's our rational capacities that make it possible to speak in terms of hypothetical or categorical imperatives. Uh, and so we can think about the, uni the universalization sorry, of the following maxim. It's permissible to treat a rational being as a means to an end uh, and not an end in themselves. Right? So it's a, According to this maxim, it's okay to override the free, rational agency of another human being. Now, what would that mean in practice? Well, you can't. You can't do it, right? You cannot 
uh, if we universalized that maxim, we would have a world in which free rational choice just wasn't possible to begin with. Uh, so it doesn't make sense to say, I rationally and freely choose to be unable to be rational and free to choose. Right? That's a contradiction. Um, and so we can derive from the first formulation of the categor categorical imperative the second formulation, which is one must never treat a rational being as merely a means to an end, but always as an end in themselves. Okay, so at this point you're, you're I'm sure, thinking, Michael, what are you talking about? This course is supposed to be international politics, and you've been going on about ethics for the last 10 minutes. Um, bear with me, there is a point. Uh, because Kant's ethics are actually really important for international politics in two ways in particular. So first, who's heard of uh, universal human rights? Only, only a few people. I think you've all heard of universal human rights, right? Um, because it's this massively important, this hugely influential idea. Uh, and we can draw a straight, a direct link from Kant's moral philosophy to the idea of universal human rights. Because the, the, the basis of human rights is that you can't treat people as a means to an end, right? or merely as a means to an end. It says everyone has value. Um, everyone needs to be treated with respect. Um, and we can't, you know, in particular, we can't do things to people that are going, that's going to undermine their free and rational ability uh, to choose. Uh, I mean, we can take a look at the, uh, at the very first line of uh, the, the uh, very first article, sorry, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it says, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of, of brotherhood. So even there, it's really captured a lot of um, Kant's uh, moral philosophy, just in that first, um, in that first article. I, th I don't think you could be more Kantian uh, if you tried. And actually, any time we talk about rights at all, we're adopting a Kantian moral framework. Right? That's, that's where we get these idea of rights to begin with. Uh, so I think it's pretty clear right, that uh, uh, Kantian ethics kind of forms the starting point of most of the discussions about global justice that we, that we have um, in classes like this one. Uh, and as well, these ideas are taken up time and time again by the critical theorists that we're going to be looking at through this course. Second, uh, Kant's moral theory forms the basis of debates around cosmopolitanism and what we owe to people in other countries. Um, and also variations on the idea are uh, taken uh, to be arguments in favour of the possibility of moral critique across boundaries of culture and power. Right? Uh, because proponents of these ideas claim that this, there's this universal moral core. Everyone is valuable, um, and this applies to everyone equally, identically across all societies, right? Uh, they may think it's a small moral core. That's like a, uh, what we all have in common morally is just this, this very minor thing, um, but they still think that it's there. And so because of this, we have grounds to critique the practices of people in other countries and other cultures. We can say, look... You know, everyone has this moral core, and the way that you're acting, even though you think it's okay, uh, is actually contravening this person's fundamental universal rights in some kind of way. Now, those on the other side of this debate, of course, um, they claim that we ought not critique the practices of those in other societies, because if we do that, then we're not respecting their freedom of choice. Uh, but this argument against this position is itself also a Kantian argument. It's just a different way of cashing out Kant's ideas. So whichever side of this debate that you're on, uh, you're working within a Kantian moral philosophy. Okay, in the final section of the class today, we'll actually look at what Kant had to say uh, directly and explicitly about international relations, about international politics. And we're focusing on the article Perpetual Peace, a Philosophical Sketch. And probably a good place to start is looking at what Kant means by the term perpetual peace to begin with. Um, and he actually, in a way, kind of criticizes his own use of this term uh, because he thinks perpetual peace is a redundant term. He thinks if we understand the term peace properly, 
we can see that it's got the idea of perpetual in it kind of built in. So he contrasts the idea of peace, perpetual peace, um, with uh, uh, the idea of a cessation of hostilities. So what do you think is the difference between these two things? What's the difference between peace and cessation of hostilities? Yep. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Exactly right. Right? Peace is perpetual, uh, and the cessation of hostilities is not perpetual. It's temporary. Uh, and this is because in the case of a cessation of hostilities, the reason for the conflict occurring to begin with, that remains. That hasn't been removed. Uh, all we're doing is just burying this cause of the conflict uh, for a while until it bubbles back up to the surface and the conflict resumes again. It could be that um, you know, the fight's been going on for a long time and both sides are exhausted and they need a break, so they come to some arrangement and they say, let's not fight for a while. But the reason they are fighting, that's still there, and that's going to come back up again in the future. So Kant, he's not interested in cessation of hostilities. He's interested in working out what we can do to bring about the conditions under which the reason for the conflict at all disappears. Right? He thinks this would be true peace. This would be perpetual peace. Now, in section one, in the preliminary articles for this uh, sketch, uh, he discusses some of the things that states need to do uh, if peace is to be possible. Uh, so the first article sets out the idea of peace that we, we just talked about, and the rest offers a, um, a series of moral prohibitions, right? uh, the breaking of which would make peace uh, a, a, a tricky proposition. So, for example, you shouldn't try to dominate other states. Um, we should try to get rid of standing armies. So he thinks having standing armies is just going to lead to conflict in the future. And he's got lots of reasons for this, and we won't go into them here. Um, you shouldn't try to interfere in the internal politics of other states. He thinks this uh, undermines the possibility of peace. And we shouldn't act during war uh, in ways that make the other side lose confidence in our ability to stick to a deal, to stick to a peace once the conflict has ended. So we can't, you know, if we torture prisoners, if we break ceasefires, if we use assassins, uh, and so on, then that gives the other side reason to think that we're not honourable, that we're not going to abide by any agreement that we that we reach with them at the end of the conflict. So basically, the the first article, the first articles are, lay, are aimed at laying out the kind of behaviours that are necessary if we're going to get to peace to begin with. Uh, ah, there we go. Okay. Uh, but he thinks as well, though. It's all well and good wagging your finger at um, you know, states, people, at leaders, and saying, you should do this, or you know, don't do that, don't use assassins, don't torture, get rid of your armies, and so on. Um, but it's a completely different story to actually get states to do any of these things. Uh, and he's perfectly well aware of this. He doesn't think that states are naturally going to act in these kinds of ways. Uh, and he doesn't see, he, he's not a complete idealist, right? He doesn't think that simply saying it's wrong for you to do this is going to be enough to stop states doing these things. And he acknowledges, actually, he acknowledges that the natural state of human beings and the natural state of, of states as well um, is actually not peaceful coexistence, but it's war. So he, he agrees with Hobbes on this. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean uh, constant open hostilities, but it also it, it does mean that there's always a threat of war under the surface. And yeah, he really does draw quite explicitly on Hobbes in this context. Um, he, he uses the term state of nature itself. So he argues that the only way to prevent outbreaks of war is for people to pledge, uh, in other words, to contract, so again, this is Hobbes, uh, with one another so that um, uh, they won't attack each other, right? And he thinks this requires um, a civil state. And this is, again, this is something that Hobbes recognized. You need a state above to stop all the other states from going to war. So we need a state with laws. We need a state with a constitution. We need a state with uh, central authority. But he thinks we can't move smoothly from peace with 
uh, within a civil state, sorry, to peace between nation states. He thinks, you know, as we talked about on Tuesday, there's a disanalogy between states and individuals when it comes to the state of nature. He thinks things become a little bit more complicated. So when we're talking about peace inside a state, all we need to worry about is the idea of civil law. Um, and Kant thinks as well, the idea of civil law uh, between states, or sorry, sorry, in the context of peace between states, he thinks civil law actually is a really important thing um, because he thinks that if there were no civil law within states, we couldn't have wider peace because there'd be conflicts within states, there'd be civil wars and so on. But he thinks we also need international law, so we need law between states, um, which is kind of obvious, right? Because uh, uh, you know, if we need civil law to stop people fighting each other within a state, then we probably need international law to stop states fighting each other. But he also thinks we need cosmopolitan law, or a law of world citizenship. Uh, and he doesn't think this means that we need to have a single state, we need to have a world state. Uh, but um, he thinks that cosmopolitan law is important because it's about the relationship of a, cit a citizen of one nation uh, and a different nation state. So like we have you know, Australia and New Zealand. They're two different states. They have different civil laws. And when I visit Australia, there needs to be uh, a form of law that governs my relationship to the Australian go uh, government. Right, because I'm not a citizen. I'm not a citizen of Australia. Uh, so I can't think. All these three kinds of law are essential for peace. If we miss any one of them, then uh, there's a state of nature existing between two parties. So it could be person-to-person -person state of nature. It could be state-to-state -state state of nature, and it could be a person-to-state -state state of nature. So let's look at Kant's recommendations. He has ideas about what. Uh, these kinds of laws should be like. So he thinks that uh, yeah, for peace to be possible, the internal constitutions of states need to be republican, he thinks. And this is not the same as democratic, okay? Uh, for Kant, democratic and republican identify two different dimensions of the form of a state, right? So there's the question first of who has the power in the state. And second is the question of how are the sovereign powers of the state constituted internally. So if we're, to, if we're to answer the first question, if we're to say who has the power in the state by saying the people, we're describing democracy, right? And we could give other possible answers to this question. We could say it's a monarch um, or some other individual in which case we're describing an autocracy. So we have democracy on the one hand, autocracy on the other hand. We could say uh, it's a nobility who has power in the state, in which case it's an uh, aristocracy, right? So these are different answers to that question. But no answer to that question is going to give us republic. That's a completely different thing. So if we're to ask the question, how is sovereign power used within that state, um, and then we answer, separation through a separation of uh, legislative and executive power, uh, then that's what we have. In that case, we have a republican state. Uh, but if we say something like um, the sovereign administers the law um, and makes the law, then we have despotism. So we've got, again, two different answers. So democracy, that's when people are in charge. And a republic is when there's a separation of executive and legislative uh, branches of the government. And we can, we can see situations where these two things come apart, right? We could have a state in which the people make and administer the laws, in which case we'd have democratic despotism, right? So Kant thinks that's a possibility. Now, Kant, for various reasons, he actually thinks that democracies are necessarily despotic. Um, he's, not actually, he's not in favor of democracies. Um, but he does think that states ought to be republican. That's his thing. He thinks it's really important that states are republican. And he thinks this for two reasons. One is a moral reason, and the other is a practical reason. In terms of the moral reason, he argues that a republic is the only form of government that secures the principles of freedom for its members and is based in a fundamental equality 
between the members of a state. Because in a republic, a place, a state governed by laws, uh, the principle of equality and the separation of powers, uh, citizens are not subject to arbitrary uh, exercises of power, right? Uh, they're able to legislate the laws that bind them. Uh, and so Kant thinks that this is the form of government that most respects the rationality and most respects the freedom of its members. Okay, we've got time. Um, but he also thinks there's a practical reason. He thinks that uh, since a republic is a state of uh, equal citizens who are all uh, legally on par with each other um, and who decide as a group whether to go to war or not to go to war, uh, then a world of republican states, he thinks, would dramatically decrease the possibility of international war. Uh, because he thinks when the citizens are the ones who decide whether or not to go to war, um, well, the citizens, they're the ones who would have to fight, right? They're all the ones who are going to pay for the costs of the war out of their own pockets. And they'll have to repair the damage after the war has finished. On the other hand, if it's a non-republican system, uh, the subjects are not citizens, right? They're not all equals, um, and the ruler is actually above the citizens, right? And in fact, we could say that the ruler isn't even a member of the state at all, right? We could say the ruler is the owner of the state, not a member of the state. And of course, the ruler <clears throat> doesn't really uh, pay any of the costs of the war themselves. Um, they make their subjects pay for all of the costs of the war. So he thinks that in a, in a non-republican system, the ruler can just declare war for a completely trivial reason, right? Um, they don't care because it's not going to affect their day-to-day -day lives at all. So anything that takes their fancy, another state insults them, well, then there's war. Who cares? Like, it's on my citizens, it's not on me. So I can't think that a world in which all states were republican is a world in which war would be far, far less likely. Now this perhaps is a familiar idea. Has anyone heard something like this before? No? Well, this is um, basically democratic peace theory, right? Which is one of like the main ideas in international politics. In fact, um, uh, sometimes it's called like the only uh, the only law or the only theory that um, uh, international uh, relations theorists are, are pretty sure about. Um, so democratic peace theory is this idea democratic states, they don't attack one another and they don't attack one another for pretty much the same reasons that Kant has given. So Kant really is the creator of this massively influential theory in international relations. Okay, so that's the internal constitution of states. What about the relationship uh, between states? Well, of course, you know, like the state of nature between individuals, a state of nature between nations is not really a, a wonderful situation to be in. Um, so Kant thinks for their own security, all states should encourage each other to enter into a constitution that's kind of analogous to a civil constitution. But he thinks this is not just a moral argument. He thinks it's actually in the interests of each state's internal security to do this. He acknowledges, though, that states aren't necessarily going uh, to do this just on its recommendation. Uh, and Kant thinks it's, you know, it's pretty, pretty bad, pretty annoying that civilized um, nation states, so-called civilized nation states, value being free to do anything they want at any time over their own security and the security of their own citizens. Um, so he thinks that you know, the relationship between nation states that we find in the world illustrates kind of just how uh, horrible human beings, how depraved human beings can be towards each other. Because we would rather be free uh, than actually protect our own citizens. That would be free, you know, we want to be free to be able to declare war whenever we want, for example. But he thinks that human beings they can be pretty awful, they can be pretty depraved, but that's not all we are. We're more than that. We're not automatically good, 
but we are capable, at least, of being good. And he thinks that, well, yeah, look, nation states, they do often ignore international law. It's no question about that. Um, but at the very least, they pay lip service to it, right? And he thinks that this demonstrates the idea that a moral capacity is kind of asleep in us. So we might ignore this uh, moral capacity, um, and we might even ignore this moral capacity most of the time, but he thinks this is a part of 